Thank you for inspiring lecture and, deep and the deep thoughts it brings with it. I hope we'll have time at the end of the panel to have a discussion. Our next speaker is Professor Stephen Ashheim. Professor Ashheim is Amaritus Professor of History at the Hebrew University Jerusalem, where he taught cultural and intellectual history in the Department of History since 1982. At the Hebrew University, he held the Vigivani Chair of European, European Studies and also acted as the director of the Franz Rosenzweig Research Center for German Literature and Cultural History. During his long-standing academic career, Professor Ashheim was a visiting professor in a long line of academic institutes. I'll mention a few of them in from the last few years. A research fellow at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research, a Stan Gold visiting professor of Jewish history at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, a fellow of the Strauss uh, Institute for Advanced Study of Law and Justice at New York University School of Law, and a fellow at the Debenbauer Institute in Leipzig, Germany. In his academic writing, Professor Ashheim deals with the history of Germany with an emphasis on the intellectual history of German society and on the history of German-Jewish relationships in Europe. A copy of the lecture will be available at the post-panel break outside at the lobby. And the title of his lecture, which... Uh, has a... Corresponds. With, with, the, with Professor Kohout's lecture, is, you, will, you will see. The title of the lecture is The Ambiguous Political Economy of Empathy. Please. I'm in Kenya for the Daber Bibrit. <laughs> and unlike Professor Kohout, I do have glasses. You didn't put on the glasses. Um, uh, so I do want to start by saying I am an historian, and I do feel a little uncomfortable. First of all, you may, by just looking at my mannerism, start to psychoanalyze me. Um, but first of all, Professor Kohut has the honor of being both a person with deep psychological knowledge and a historian, and I'm just a historian invited here. I'm not quite sure why. Um, so you'll have, to, you'll have to grasp that what I'm going to do will not have too much clearly psychological uh, content. Lastly, um, you're a very generous audience, and the applause that you gave to Professor Kohut, which was completely justified, I'm going to say some terribly controversial things. So I'm sure at the end, I'm not going to get applause, but something like booze. All right. You'll be, you'll be, I, mean, I think you'll be surprised. Uh, okay, so here we go. Um, there is a trend nowadays in evolutionary psychology and in neurobiology, which holds that empathy is a generalized human capacity. Indeed, they tell us, empathy is not just for humans, but all kinds of animal species have empathy. The primates have empathy. Those of you who know Francis Duval's work will see the degree to which both not just humans, but animals possess this capacity. Moreover, you have social scientists and philosophers today who are arguing, like we are in the age of globalization, and together with globalization, a kind of globalizing empathic capacity is developing. To the degree that the world gets bigger, to that degree, empathy is becoming more and more a general capacity. So this is kind of revising the conventional Hobbesian worldview. The Hobbesian worldview is that life is nasty, brutal, and short, and that human nature 
ain't so very empathic or sympathetic. What is argued here is that humankind is equally a cooperating and generous rather than selfish species. Now, this is a view, a civilizational view of progress, one in which older tribal and primitive loyalties are being superseded by a kind of universalism in which advanced notions of dignity and humanity and empathic relations exist. There is a book by Jeremy Rifkin, who sees the world of 1960s and 70s, I quote, the greatest single empathic surge in history. And he says, when we say to civilize, we mean to empathize. Now, viewed from the ground, and the ground that I stand on is the ground that you stand on. That's the Middle East. <laughs> and in the Middle East, this simply does not seem to hold. It simply does not capture the social and political and psychological reality in which we live. In fact, this whole idea that we're becoming a, civil, a worldwide empathic civilization seems to me to miss exactly what is most characteristic about empathy. And we heard from Thomas Kohut one example of this, but let me put it in a more generalized fashion. What is most characteristic about empathy is the fact that it is politically structured, that it is channeled and directed, encouraged or blocked, according to any number of cultural, ideological, religious, racial, ethnic, national, geographical, and all kinds of other factors. Empathic impulses, the way we choose to empathize with one group rather than another, usually is a function, and I think this came out in Professor Kohut's talk, as organized impulses, as normative, very often governmental impulses, which structure the way in which we empathize or the ways in which we disempathize. These are usually connected to regimes of power. So what I'm suggesting here is that we require a kind of political economy of empathy, one that will account for the multiple, very often ambiguous ways in which we portion out our empathic impulses, in which we control them or allocate them, or indeed narrow them or the opposite. Allow them to expand, allow them to open up, but they don't come out of human nature, whatever that is. I don't know what psychiatrists and psychologists now believe to be human nature, but that's another question. So, then all kinds of things would have to take place here. In a political economy of empathy, to what degree do you need empathy to resolve conflicts? Is empathy the precondition for resolving a conflict, or is it the result? These are questions. In fact, it may be that empathy may be indifferent or even opposed to political settlement. So what I want to do here is just suggest some various directions. By the way, I gave Gabriella instructions not to show you the paper beforehand, because if you read it beforehand, you would see all the weaknesses and the problems in the, in the lecture. Therefore, you can see it after. So let me begin with an autobiographical confession. As you can hear, although I know Hebrew, my accent is not Israeli. I'm South African born. So I lived through this very demeaning era of apartheid. I've also been, like Thomas, a student of the gross human inhumanity of the Holocaust and other genocides. But I also happen to live in a place where the problem of empathy is crucial 
to the Israel-Palestine conflict. So you could... Oh, wait, this is not a... Wait a minute, is it? I'll tell you who to vote for at the end of this talk. <laughs> I, so, so what I'm saying is my life seems to be overdetermined by living in problems where empathy is crucial. Well, I think it's probably in every country in the world. I've always been astonished. In fact, I remain very, very troubled by either the incapacity or probably the structured incapacity to attempt both cognitively and effectively to place oneself in the position of politically subjugated groups and to recognize their humanity and their humiliation. And what I'm saying is that this is a function of political structuring. <coughs> Perhaps it's, it, it may be that the fact that I chose to become an historian lies not only in the drive to critically interrogate my own narrative, and I think that's what historians must do, but also, for historians, it's absolutely crucial to place oneself, regardless of what or whom one is studying, in the position uh, of the other. So, I know that when I, I sound like this a bit holy, the fact that you clapped hands worries me. I don't want to be a preacher, but what I'm suggesting is that there are all kinds of difficulties with my goody-goody position. I know that my... I have a stipulative definition of empathy. What is that definition? It is the cognitive and the affective attempt to place oneself in the position of the individual or collective other. It's both cognitive and affective. But I know that this definition is ethically ambiguous and not necessarily morally obligating. One analyst, his name is Lou Agosta, have said that if you want to be a good torturer, you have to be empath empathetic. You have to know what your victim is going to feel and how effectively to torture him. If you want to know who in Shakespeare's work is the most empathetic character, his name is Iago, because he knows exactly how to get under Othello's skin. So empathy does not necessarily have to be ethical. It should be, in my view, but it is not necessarily. In fact, if the historian wants to comprehend the psychology and the motivations of Nazi perpetrators or Russian rapists or Rwandan killers, this must involve an act of empathy, of entering into their world. But please note, understanding their world does not entail identification or sympathy. They are not the same kinds of things. So, um, if you're a historian, and I know you're not, so why should I bore, bore, bore you with this? But I am, because I'm interested in it. <laughs> there are three aspects of empathy which, for a historian, come into play. One is empathy as an object of historical investigation, which we heard brilliantly from Thomas Cobbett. That would be one. Two, it's a methodological requirement. I assume, too, that as psychologists, that's absolutely crucial. So it's also a methodological requirement. But it is also, for me, a normative concern. It has to do with how I ethically uh, come to, to certain subjects. So what are the politically relevant components of empathy? I'm just going to give you one or two examples. Let's begin with some fragments of information. My esteemed Prime Minister from South Africa, Henrik de Voort, you'll be delighted to hear, he got his doctorate in psychology. And his doctorate in psychology was based upon, was called the blunting of the emotions. Kahuta Rigashot. <laughs> 
Now, if you're going to, if you, if you're going to be, I suppose I can give you lessons in racial domination. If you want to be a racial dictator, you have to know how to blunt people's emotions. You know how to deal with them. So I can't think of a better example than for Wurt's PhD. Now, um, the blocking of empathy, that's what he was talking about. There are any number of techniques, and I think Thomas has brilliantly spoken about them, denial, repression, de-rationalization, <coughs> dehumanization. All of this is crucial to the function of any racial system. You just don't have it without those things. Denial, repression, rationalization, dehumanization. All of these were clearly at work, as you heard in the Third Reich. Um, but it is also blocking empathy is usually absolutely vital for the perpetration of genocide, any genocide, and atrocities, but also for the waging of war. You cannot really kill the people who are your enemy with a great deal of sympathy, compassion, and empathy. War po World War poetry, I'm not going to read it to you now, but if you read the poetry of Wilfred o Owen about how they were taught not, how they were demonizing the enemy and the importance of that, and yet the breaking down of their own consciousness is very interesting. A political economy of empathy would have to deal with something else which I'm not going to deal with, but which I think needs mentioning. The way in which we empathize, of course, with our own group, always we have massive amounts of empathy for ourselves. It's quite remarkable. But the lower you go down in the chain, the less empathy there is. And it's quite interesting to see, if you look even just historically, there was the notion that working class people, or black people, or minorities, outsiders, feel pain less than we do. Of course. So you can operate on them without anesthetics. They don't feel pain in the same way we do. In other words, what I'm quickly suggesting is you can't have a theory of empathy unless you have a theory of stereotypes because we come to other groups through stereotypical lenses. So, um, all of this uh, I, is, is for a future uh, study, but let me get now to the specific case of the Shoah. Thomas Koho dealt very beautifully with the Shoah itself, and I don't have to deal with it in any, in any way uh, that deals with this, the situation itself. The lack of empathy there, he has documented superbly. What I want to do here is I want to examine the role of empathy in the post-Holocaust remembrance, after the Holocaust. And we don't come out so well on that. In that fact, we are faced with a certain paradox. On the one hand, as the event itself unfolded, the absence of empathy was absolutely shocking. And that's what we heard from Thomas. On the other hand, as the years go by, the further away the Shoah becomes, and it really is now becoming a far away event, it becomes more and more ingrained into our consciousness, a fundamental part of our moral and empathic equipment. Why did it lack then, and why is it so central now? What does this tell us about the structure of the political economy of empathy? Now, um, to be sure, the model of Nazi genocide as radical evil is not a worldwide thing. It really just applies to Anglo-American spheres, Western and Central Europe societies, Eastern Europe to some degree, and our own country. The basis for this is clear, obviously. 
something in the event itself. It's state-sanctioned criminality. It's taboo-breaking aims. It's industrial methods. It's huge scale. Of course, renders it central as part of our conception of evil. Yet, that's not sufficient to account for its absolute centrality within European, American, and Israeli discourse. Empathic hierarchies are not unmediated. Representations or memory is not simply a question of objective reality. I would like to suggest that our enduring fascination with National Socialism and the atrocities it committed, our constant connections to it, apart from the obvious ones, and they are obvious, I don't have to tell this audience what they are, but there is another factor, and that resides in the particular nature and identity, both of the victims and the perpetrators. What I'm trying to say is that there is an added reason for our concentration, and that is a kind of what I call an inverted kind of Eurocentricism. Our rather ethnocentric sense of scandal and riddle. Our astonishment that the most cultured, enlightened society, Germany, could engage in such barbarous killing. The most enlightened, cultured nature, nation does this. And I'm suggesting to you that one of the reasons for our complete obsession with it is, here is an example of a genocide perpetrated by civilized killers on civilized victims. Now, why is this important for the structure of empathy? It is, for fundamentally, I'm arguing, that there is a kind of political geography of empathy. We are most moved by, empathically connected to, atrocities that come most close to our own home. Even if you look, by the way, I don't know if you know the numbers of killed under com Soviet communism. Something like, there are all kinds of estimates, 20 million, I'm not quite sure. I would venture to say that our relationship to the victims of the Gulag, it's there, but it's pretty minor. I would even say that if there's a kind of map of the West, to the degree that you go east or south, our empathic capacities decrease. <coughs> so what really is our empathic relationship to the murders in Cambodia, the genocide in Rwanda, Bosnia, Cambodia, Sudan, all these are removed from our own Western epicenter, our own Eurocentric empathic ways. I'm not going to mention one other small kind of genocide. It's happening a few, how many kilometers away? I'm not quite sure. And, and it's true for me, I'm not being holier than thou. That same kind of empathic bluntness applies. So, uh, what I'm suggesting here, in terms of a more general theory, is the following. Michael Ignatieff has suggested that our ethics usually follow our ethnicity. That's quite deep. That empathy takes root within tribal, ethnic, or national boundaries. And these are most naturally expressed within its confines. So, um, what I'm suggesting here is that despite contemporary rhetoric, our uh, uh, atrocities are more acceptable when performed in distant places and upon uncivilized populations. Uncivilized, in inverted commas. 
The closer to home that they are perpetrated, the more problematic they become. Um, in a way, there's something quite interesting, an inverted logic of the way in which we see the Holocaust. The Holocaust was the most sophisticated killing. They used industrial methods. But in Africa, they used machetes. So that's not, somehow that doesn't really add up to serious killing. There is also something of that in our connections. So, now what I'm going to say, uh, I get to perhaps disagreements. I think that obviously remembrance of the Holocaust is a vital and crucial endeavor. I'm not arguing against it, clearly. But what I am suggesting is that while such historical or past emphasis, empathy, empathy is necessary, it is far easier to have empathy in relation to the past than it is to regard to deal with present political empathy and that you can use past empathy to instrumentalize or flatten or muffle present empathy. Now, the central need in Germany to maintain memory, that's absolutely clear. And I think what they're doing is completely correct. But in latter-day Israel, in our own Israel, there is a danger that the valorization of the Holocaust will suffuse, perhaps even overwhelm, the cultural will to empathic energy. This kind of self-referential collective empathy can easily muffle or mask or act as a preventative for the far more difficult task of present empathy for contemporary victimhood. I hope I'm being clear. You may not be happy, but you, at least it's clear. It, settle down, everyone, settle down. In this way, Shoah memorialization can also function as a counter-empathic narrative, a means of either minimalizing or omitting Palestinian narratives, a tool in the ongoing and unproductive battle of comparative victimization. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute, and this is a tactic that is used all the time. I'm not comparing. I'm not saying they're the same thing. Or, does that mean you can only empathize with one thing? That would be absurd. So by saying it blunts, I'm not suggesting they are the same. Historians like distinctions. Um, in other words, um, what I'm saying is that uh, this has become part of Israeli uh, political economy of uh, empathy. I have a few minutes, yeah? Okay. This leads us into a wider question. The conditioning role of ideologies such as nationalism in annexing and allocating empathic impulses. There's very, something obvious in Ignatiev's idea that ethics follows ethnicity and that empathy is strongest within, even if not confined to, our own tribal or group boundaries. And that's natural. I mean, I really am going to prefer my baby child to yours. <laughs> there is an obvious structure to it. But there is another normative question for any political economy of empathy. It concerns the possibilities of extending the range of empathy precisely to those who are outside one's boundaries, especially, perhaps, for those who belong to the opposed camp. It's very easy for me to empathize with victims of the tsunami. I actually don't really empathize. But there's no, nothing at stake. It has nothing to do with my responsibilities. So, um, I, I, I'm going to leave out a long passage, passage here 
about the role of Zionism in creating empathy or lack of empathy. Um, I, I, do, I do not believe, for instance, that um, uh, there wasn't such thing or there was no recognition. Um, but I do think, for the main part, a certain myopic blocking out of the indigenous Arabs' plight not an act of hatred or racism. I don't believe that there was. It was a kind of myop myopic blocking did apply. And that is because Zionism satisfied and addressed real, urgent, and authentic needs. But because it proffered an authentic alternative to the Jewish predicament, a selective blindness to the presence of the Palestinians may have been a psychological precondition for implementing that Zionist project. It, is this, it may have been a necessary myopia, but it's no less myopic for that. Zionism cannot simply be labeled as a Western settler movement, but it is also that, and as in South Africa, I'm trying to make this universal, it's not just us. South Africa, the United States, Australia, and so on and so on, to openly acknowledge the price that we have exacted on an indigenous population was and remains an extremely difficult empathic act to perform. At times, there is even a denial that an indigenous population was here in the first place. Even if such displacement is not intended, this was the result. And although over the past de de decade a degree of recognition has percolated into Israeli academic discourse, and I think so far the reactions of this audience have been, so far no tomatoes have reached my face, <laughs> has been sympathetic, which reflects something quite deep about the shift in Israeli recognition, in Israeli preparedness to face this, and there is now a massive <coughs> kluft, gulf, between Israeli academia and political norms. Is Asa Kasher in the audience? <laughs> now, a little bit of self-criticism. Self-criticism. I'm stating this all from a liberal pr a perspective. I don't know if you know, Robert Frost has a wonderful definition of the liberal. A liberal is someone who can't even take his own side in an argument. A liberal who mishu she afiru lo yachol inkot betzad shelo bevikuach. And that's me usually. Okay. In other words, what I've been saying may sound like a, you know, a, a, a yafé nefesh. What could be worse? Actually, the thing that's worse than a yafé nefesh is a mukhuar nefesh. But anyway. Um, from a, a, a liberal perspective that many will find is naive, that is unwilling to recognize the reality of, em of being enemies, and that it is what I've been saying may indeed be blind to the problematic and times brutal realities and practices also of Arab society. It's not just a one-way street here. Despite the Arab Spring and the, the premises of Enlightenment humanism, the practice of self-criticism, and the corresponding empathic drive of the Arabs to grasp the other, this is hardly characteristic of their traditionally, doggedly traditional nature and the structure of Arab societies. There are grounds for Israeli suspicions and fears. No one is denying that. But because we constantly insist upon belonging to the Western enlightened nations, the question of our own commitments to empathic recognition, we at least must admit 
that we have to face up to the consequences of our own actions, which will not go away. Two more pages. Now, I'm not denying for one moment that the tendency to empathize with, our, with those who are closest to us is the, is the most natural uh, part of, of empathy. In fact, evolutionary psychologists tell us that empathy is designed for cooperative ventures within the group, but certainly not without the group. But as a moral quality, empathy becomes politically relevant when it demands access to other selves, even those to whom we may be locked in conflict. Now, I don't want to go into this no time. The question is, which individuals are able to do this? Because at the moment, the norm, the power of norms is enormous. What about those who are not caught by the norms? There's this wonderful experiment, I know psychologists now say it's unethical, by Stanley Milgram. The interesting thing is, not those who obeyed, those who refused to obey. Those are the people who are able to extend those empathic capacities. I have no idea who they are and what explains that. I don't think Milgram himself knew. So I'm arguing here that multiple problems do arise from any simple scheme of the, of the political economy of, of empathy. Um, Certainly, if you want to extend the range of political empathy, surely this demands reciprocity from the other side. On the other hand, it is also indubitably true that those in power can more easily exercise empathy than those who are the victims of that power. Very difficult if you're a victim of power to empathize with power. Yet, as one letter writer put it brilliantly in Haaretz with regard to the Palestinians, why do we have to mark the day of their disaster, which sprang from the failure of their attempts to massacre the Jews in 1948 and to annihilate it? Why do we have to tell, to pity, to recall, and to feel the pain of those whose wishes, actions, education, and prayers are aimed at every day at getting rid of us from this land. So I don't want to make things too simple. However, if you view matters purely in terms of power relations, we shouldn't relieve the other side either of moral freedom and agency. The subjugated Arabs are not just playthings of history. They too have some responsibility for their own fate. Not all victims are completely moral. We are tempted to believe that because you're a victim, you're moral. That's also an error. Here I am undercutting my own talk. I see signals. No, 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 no. Take your time. Stop being so empathetic. <laughs> I'll make it even more difficult. Moshe Dayan, in his eulogy for Roy Rotberg and Nachal Oz, in 1956, April. He said, I can empathize with the palace. No, no, sorry. Somebody else said, this is also a distinction, I can empathize with the Palestinians, but do not sympathize for their cause. So it becomes more problematic. Moshe Dayan, he uses empathy as a key motivating force for continuing rather than ending the battle. So empathy is multi, I quote, let us not cast blame on the murderers today. Why should we deplore their hatred for us? For eight years, this is 1956, they have been sitting in the refugee camps in Gaza, they still do, and before their eyes we have been transforming the land and the villages where they and their fathers dwelt into our state. We are a generation that settles the land, and here it comes. Without the steel helmet and the cannon's fire, we can't build trees and houses. Let us not be deterred from seeing the loathing that is inflaming and filling the lives of hundreds of thousands of Arabs who live around us. Let us not avert our eyes, lest our arms weaken. 
full understand, full empathic knowledge, but with a very different conclusion. Last page and a half, I swear. It's okay, take it. Um, for that, um, some, I would argue, some degree of identification is necessary if you want to render a politically, or empathy politically relevant. I just don't believe that empathy is universally possible. There are those, for instance, some of my friends, they sign every petition possible. <laughs> every local petition, what's happening in Sudan, what's happening with Mr. Trump. I don't know why I'm looking at Thomas Cole. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not possible. In other words, what I'm, what I'm arguing here is um, that one realistic em empathic polit politics and morality obligates us not in terms of universalism, but in terms of areas and localities where we are ourselves responsible and can actually undertake action. Still, the ambiguity lies even uh, deeper. Uh, and I'll, I'll just mention uh, what, one or two things here. I don't want to go on too much. It may be that empathy is not a useful way in, or, in order to resolve a conflict. There's a long literature, I'll just say this. Perhaps to resolve conflict, empathy is not necessary. There is a hell of a danger. Some guy in California read my paper on empathy, and it's kind of get-together groups touchy-feely groups about how to feel nice with each other. That's not what I mean by the politics of empathy. I mean by politics of empathy what I spoke about. And Hannah Arendt says, nonsense. Empathy and compassion has got absolutely nothing to do with political reality. Conflicts of, are resolved not on the basis of empathy, but on the basis of justice. And sometimes justice and empathy can clash. So I'm not making my own lane, uh, life easy. Uh, Cynthia Ward has characterized empathy as political valium. It's a kind of, you, empathy may help to some degree, but unless you institutionalize an agreement in structures and institutions, you can't live a life full of empathy. If we had to be empathic to everyone else, can you imagine that in Israeli society? I can't. <laughs> anyway, so my last paragraph reads this way. The aim of this paper has been just to fashion the outlines of a political economy of empathy and to formulate some patterns of its structure and to list some of its problems. But I'm also saying something else which may contradict myself. It is a plea to extend our range of empathic, humanizing impulses, to sympathetically imagine alternative stories about others and apply them to situations in which the loss of human face stands directly in contradiction to those who say we have already arrived at a universal empathic civilization. Thank you.